focused on the work and influence of the Institute of Public Affairs. Those activist, but still wonkish libertarians, warriors of the vocal right, they're running the country, according to some. Opinion divides pretty strongly on whether that's true, and whether, if it is, it's, it's for good or ill. It's a discussion that raises broader questions, though. Who's who in the zoo of Australian think tanks? What exactly is a think tank? Where do they come from? Who pays? How do they seek to exert influence, and to what end? Perhaps most fundamentally, in, in the world of Australian public policy, is that world of public policy enhanced by their existence? To chew this over, I'm joined by Dr. Damien Carl. He's a senior lecturer in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Sydney. Bob Burton is author of Inside Spin, a former editor of Sourcewatch, a writer for PR Watch, and Terry Moran. He's national president of the Institute of Public Administration Australia, one time secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and cabinet good morning to you all uh, damien uh, to begin uh, perhaps with uh, a little bit of context the, the ipa i mentioned it, it's one of the oldest uh, in quotes think tanks in the country one of the most prominent um what's its backstory and when did the others pop along what what's the the brief history of, of the other voices well, the ipa was formed in the 1940s uh it was a in the 1940s and up until the 1970s, it was really advocating a broadly conservative Keynesian position. So it was part of that post-war consensus about the desirability of government regulating the economy to achieve full employment but from a very conservative and anti-communist position, always fairly close to the Liberal Party. In the 1970s, that began to change and it began to advocate what we would recognise today as a more neoliberal, new right, kind of agenda, still with a, a conservative anti-communist tinge to it, uh, and it really uh, grew from the 1970s. Uh, and since the 1970s, a host of other think tanks have sprung up on the right and the left. So there's the Centre for Independent Studies in, in Sydney, a neoliberal think tank. Uh, more recently, a range of progressive think tanks have developed, the Centre for Policy Development, the Australian Institute per capita. Uh, etc. And there are a range of more centrist think tanks as well, the uh, Lowy Institute, Grattan Institute, etc. It, it's a structure that, that, that conservative politics sort of refined and, uh, and used, I think, in, in early days. That's right. So I think they pro have really provided the template for other think tanks uh, across the spectrum. And I'd, my call is that in Australia it's the conservative and neoliberal think tanks that have been most successful uh, at intervening within uh, public debate. Uh, Terry, are we talking about apples and pears here? Um, a think tank is, is a convenient uh, descriptor that we apply to a lot of organisations. Yeah, it's a very broad term and it includes advocacy groups, which is what uh, the Institute of Public Affairs is really, and to an extent the uh, Centre for Independent Studies in Sydney, and then groups which uh, purport to be uh, evidence-based in their policy work. Um, and it's beyond even the range of organisations that, that were listed previously. So it would include, in my view, in some people's minds, even the Productivity Commission, because it is independent and it d does depend upon references. That's, therefore, it's not truly independent, but it is very strong in its view that it should do evidence-based policy work from an economic perspective to launch public debates which may eventually lead to changes in government policy. So, um, if you take it at, at that level, um, the, the ones that aren't within government, and Grattan's an example of that, Lowy is another one, the new Mitchell Institute in Melbourne would be a third, there are others. The ones that aren't within government uh, worry about where their money is coming from, worry mm. about their independence, and have to put a lot of effort into figuring out what are the issues to go after at any given point in time, where the test of whether they're any good is do they have an impact on the public debate, but even more importantly, do they have an impact on what government does? And that, to Bob, to bring you in here, that, that, that issue of where the money comes from and I guess the, the temptation perhaps to almost work as an advocate for one's, one's uh, donating clients is an issue that, that think tanks need to confront, some more than others. Yes, and, and I mean, at its core, I mean, the origins of it were, typically say, for example, with the Institute of Public Affairs, was a funny mix of corporate sponsorship and 
the support of individuals um, in the last decade or so, um, yeah, much more has become public about how it is that think tanks pitch for funds and who gives, gives to them, even though it's, it's still pretty, uh, yeah, it's comparatively limited disclosure. I mean, the one example which I tied down when I was doing Inside Spin was getting freedom information documents from uh, Telstra when uh, they were being courted by the Institute of Public Affairs for funding of a campaign which was designed to be critical of Australian Competition and Consumer Commission over their regulation of telecommunications policy and a whole range of other things that were related to Telstra's interests. So Telstra was funding, and this was at the time when it was majority public owned, um, funding the Institute of Public Affairs. The IPA didn't disclose, Telstra didn't disclose until such time as there was a question raised in Parliament. Um, but it was a very close relationship where the funding pitch came I was followed with you know, discussions between Telstra and the IPA about exactly what their joint work plan was going to be. Mm. Which, Damien, it goes to Terry's point too about the, the distinction between a, an evidence-based think tank which is interested in the, uh, the idea and, and establishing that proposition through good, solid work and groups which fundamentally try to ad advocate for, for a proposition. That's right, and I think that's an important distinction. The think tanks we probably hear most of are the advocacy think tanks, but probably the evidence-based think tanks are actually much more numerous. But I think the advocacy-based think tanks are really interesting because um, we can look at their tactics and, and think about which have been most successful and why. Uh, and I think one of the one of the tactics that the neoliberal right-wing think tanks have used that's been very, very successful is to put forward quite radical, almost utopian ideas with the goal not so much of directly trying to convince politicians of, that they should implement X or Y policy, but trying to radicalise the centre of debate and shift the centre of debate further to uh, the values that they hold dear, whether it be the right-wing think tanks or, or the left-wing think tanks. It's also where, where Terry, a, a group like that working closely with a political organisation can do the the groundwork on, on what might be fairly toxic policy ideas can establish a debate around an idea and, and prepare that for political acceptance. And the whole approach is lifted out of the United States where there are huge numbers of um, advocacy think tanks, mainly on the right but also on the left, and they all find their own audience and that all contributes to the bubble of American democracy. In Australia, uh, the right-wing groups are somewhat better resourced than the progressive groups like the Centre for Policy Development and so forth. Um, and uh, purity seems to be important to them uh, without fully recognising that nothing much that's big in Australian politics happens unless politicians manage to take the community with them. And that's the critical point that John Howard and Bob Hawke mm. made before the National Press Club uh, this week when they were there for a, an event celebrating the history of that organisation as well. And they're absolutely right and I'd go further, and John Howard, I think, made this point also. If you want major reform, you've essentially got to have bipartisan support. And he gave, John Howard gave, bipartisan support to a lot of the reforms that uh, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating pursued in the 80s into the 90s. Right at the moment, the prospects of bipartisan support for major reforms at a national level in Australia, in my mind, could not be further away largely because of the way politics has been changed over the last three or four years into populist uh, combat between warriors who believe that they can give no ground on ideas and thus on the floor. Which is a combat often fueled by these organisations. Uh, yes, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, often uh, the uh, spokespersons for these organisations uh, who are often chosen because they're media friendly will enter the public domain in support of these ideas but th thus far the right wing think tanks don't seem in my mind to have much success in really convincing the public of their mainstream ideas. We're talking about think tanks in Australia, uh, Terry Moore in there, National President, the Institute of Public Administration. Also joined by Bob Burton, uh, author of Inside Spin, a former editor of Sourcewatch, Dr. Damien Carl too, senior lecturer in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Sydney, and sees a Sunday Extra. Uh, Damien, is there, a, is there a good role for the more considered think tank in, in breaking down what, what Terry describes there? There's this polarised, ideologically driven uh, political culture that through the 
presenting of reasoned uh, thoughts around policy ideas. Is, is that perhaps a good model for the think tank in the public discussion? Oh, sure, absolutely, and politicians are always looking for uh, new ideas, and the think tanks also provide forums uh, where politicians can articulate, articulate ideas, public servants can articulate ideas, and other intellectuals can articulate ideas, and some of the uh, more centrist or evidence-focused think tanks uh, also attempt to provide, uh, I guess, pragmatic solutions to perceived problems, uh, whereas the advocacy think tanks tend, as, as Terry's indicated, to be much more uh, ideological uh, and, as Terry said, pure in their advocacy, less concerned with putting forward pragmatic solutions to uh, policy problems uh, and more concerned with trying to shift the centre of the, de the debate. But there's definitely a positive role uh, for think tanks within uh, public policy in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, I, I wonder, Bob, if it's, if it's somewhat opened up, if, if it's, uh, the role is even greater because of the, the sort of the hollowness of political structures in this uh, in the country. The political parties have um, you know, moved away from base, have moved away from um, a lot of the ideas around policy creation are more dependent on external input for those ideas. I think that's certainly true, but, uh, but one of the key platforms for you know, the advocacy think tanks, which are sort of you know, dubbed the Institute of Public Affairs, a, a battle tank more than a think tank. Um, and it operates more as a, akin as to a, um, a non-profit PR firm. It's well, sort of get up on one hand and the IPA on the other, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but is there, a, you know, at, at the same time that uh, political parties have become much stronger <coughs> to the membership base and the, you know, the, the debates within them, um, the media is also hollowed out. So one of the key platforms for the advocacy think tanks has become the provision of vast numbers of freely provided opinion columns which fill up the column centimetres at no cost to the media outlets. Mm. Um, in itself, that's no great thing, but, but no great problem, except that y if then you start to see the biggest think tanks start to dominate because they've got more people on staff who can tune out more and get more placements. Um, and it also and they probably hire up. accordingly. That's right, and it also dovetails into the structure of the Australian media. You know, for print publications, it's predominantly in Murdoch publications, and Rupert Murdoch was uh, at one time uh, you know, actively involved in the Institute of Public Affairs. Um, now, in itself, OK, that's all fair. One of the weaknesses, though, is that most uh, publications, when they print columns from people from think tanks, don't request uh, for them to disclose any actual or potential conflict of interest, and that's exactly how you know, the role of think tanks as non-profit PR firms actually works, is it's designed to, to conceal the source of funding, so we don't know quite who's trying to persuade us, whether it's actually the think tank or whether it's uh, you know, from a part of their obligation to one of their sponsors. But, but Terry, was it... Was it uh, some of these issues that, that, that you were attempting to resolve when you had the thought and you were instrumental in its foundation around the, the Grattan Institute. That's true, and uh, one of those things was just mentioned, that is, what was happening in the media, and this is about seven or eight years ago, what was happening in the media, and even then it was apparent that there would be a dearth of uh, capacity within the print media in particular to do investigative work, and it seemed to Steve Brax who brought the argument that uh, the desirability of having what became Grattan in the middle, uh, admittedly with endowments from government, from BHP and from NAB, and then they withdrew and didn't try to manage the programs of Grattan. Uh, having something in there to, to do proper research, clearly written, that was readable in its own right, but then able to be picked up in the media and uh, serve as a bit of an antidote to the far out stuff that was also becoming more apparent at that time. This was a very important point. And the other important point that was on the table of Grattan was the, uh, the difficulty that academics generally were having in communicating with the public, the, uh, mm. the lost without translation theme for academics. Because policy is essentially multidisciplinary, and only a think tank in the Australian uh, context, uh, whether it's university-based or not, we argued, would have the capacity to pull all of that together and make policy-relevant suggestions as to where the country should go. This is the risk, isn't it, Damien, in, in the current discussion around the way in which particular bodies influence particular governments, that we're, we're tarring everybody with the one brush. And, and as, as Terry points out there, there are particular linkages and, and gaps that
a properly constituted, uh, well-disciplined and rigorous think tank can fill. That's absolutely right. Different think, think tanks use different tactics and, as we've said before, it depends upon whether they're really an advocacy think tank or a more uh, policy and problem-oriented think tank, such as I'd say that the Grattan Institute is. And Terry just identified a, a very good point in terms of uh, the difficulties or the pressures that academics face in terms of communicating ideas to a broader public or producing research that's policy relevant. Uh, the incentives that exist within the university system in Australia uh, really work against academics communicating policy relevant research uh, in favour of communicating with other academics. So I think that, as Terry said, that helps to explain the rise of, of uh, those policy-focused think tanks in recent years. Well, but what, what's a useful radar, just in closing, for the, for the, the humble punter, the, the observer and the consumer of these thoughts to, to bear in mind when, when considering Australian think tanks? Look, I think the key thing is to always follow the money trail. Um, it's an old journalistic maxim and it still holds true. Um, if there's uh, you know, inadequate disclosure, then we're not to know who's trying to speak to us. And we should always... Uh, uh, be finely tuned to exactly whether these groups are independent as they claim or whether they're not. And Terry, in your government experience, is, is, is that radar well tuned within political power uh, or, or are politicians susceptible to the, uh, the well presented piece of think tankery? The best politicians always have a reference back to the community and what the community will wear. And a think tank or an advocacy think tank that doesn't come to terms with that ultimately doesn't end up having much success in influencing what government will do. Their rhetoric might might crop up and might appear to be respected, but the reality of what they want, want to do won't be. So the Centre for Independent Studies has been campaigning for over a year to go from 35 to 30, that is 35% of GDP devoted to the public sector, down to 30. Well, you could judge from the reaction to a bit of shaving in the recent federal budget that that's a hell of a thing to convince the public to accept. Well, there you are, public. Um, bear their outpourings, um, well, give them due consideration and, and perhaps bear in mind that rather interesting definition we've discussed this morning between the, the think tank, the evidence-based body, and the group more inclined towards advocacy. You will know them by their works. Uh, our thanks this morning to uh, our guest, Dr. Damien Carl, his senior lecturer in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Sydney, Bob Burton, author of Inside Spin, former editor of Sourcewatch, writer now for PR Watch, and Terry Moran, National President of the Institute of Public Administration Australia. This is Sunday Extra. Yes, well, I've come to regard the Institute of Public Affairs as an extraordinarily radical right-wing fascist neo-Thatcherite Reaganistic laissez-faire free market advocacy group and they call themselves a think tank but uh, they are the mouthpieces for the people who have apparently captured the parliamentary Australian Liberal Party they are the people who admit that 500,000 Australians under 30 are going to require emergency assistance, so they've put aside $250 million to assist 500,000 under 30 year olds who are going to be thrown into emergency conditions because they're not going to have any unemployment relief. And the Liberal side of politics has a think take tank based anecdote to the effect that it's better off to make them starve for six months when they have no job than pay them enough to keep the law while they're looking for a job. And when I say keep the law I don't mean keep the law about not smoking a bit of pot or not getting drunk underage. I'm talking about keeping the law that says you don't go and bash people for their handbag or their wallet. The, the laws that say you don't do break and enters because you're looking for food. The laws that, that say you don't do carjackings or kidnappings or any of the other shit that goes on in banana republics that don't have any unemployment benefits for their citizenry. 
And meanwhile, although they've put aside $250 million for emergency assistance for the 500,000 under 30-year-old Australians who are expected to be thrown on the streets, the Department of Social Security admitted under questioning in Senate Estimates Committee hearings last week that they had done no work estimating the public impact of the, the announced measures in the budget. So they haven't actually done any, any research to determine what effect these measures will have because they've got their glorious think tank anecdote. Ah. Oh. Yeah, so if Get Up is considered to be the extreme activist wing of the left wing side of politics, then the Institute of Public Affairs is equally far out there on the other side. And the, the difference between the two is that Get Up works from an evidence based policy, whereas the Institute of Public Affairs works from a traditional ancestral worship of uh, wealth. Orbs on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.